Hello, can you hear me? Uh, Raghavi, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Let me just share my screen also and check. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
thank you all for your patience so uh, let us start the event start by doing what's necessary then do what's possible and suddenly you are doing the impossible this is what we say to ourselves while crossing all the milestones every time hello all and good evening to day one we have successfully completed the day one events and workshops of kurukshetra 21 and we are here to ease with some smoothening words from our esteemed guest speakers i would like to welcome our guest speakers for the day a warm welcome to mr tathagat verma head of strategy and operations at walmart lab next i would like to extend my welcome to ms mutumari s head of data science relio further i extend my welcome to mr rishikesh kulkarni provide dynamic I would like to express our gratitude to our event sponsors, Cronus and Guvitech, our associate title sponsor, Autodesk, our co-sponsor and certificate partner, Hyperstack, our education partner, the University of Trent, and the internship partner, Active. K-Talks is an exciting combo of speakers from varied domains who take on stage with their enlightening string of words to overtake the audience. I assure you that you will get loads of insights from our speakers this evening. Progressing right for over 225 long years, we all take self-esteem to be a part of this marvelous institution. CEG Tech Forum aims to bring and push forward this age-long legacy to Kurukshetra. Originated in 2006, The CEG Tech Forum is the official student-run technical hub of the college. Among 25 plus distinct tech and cultural clubs, CEG Tech Forum is the only organization to achieve an ISO 9001-2015 quality certification. CTF shelters all the brains with inspiring thoughts. They help to boost up the unimaginable fantasies into awestruck reality. CEG if also braces those people with other skills in other fields such as design coding resource management marketing and so forth ctf sets a benchmark with its well structured corporate style of work culture and setting constitution and technological contribution and kurukshetra is the magnum opus of ctf kurukshetra is the back where the war will happen not with swords but with brains kurukshetra is an annual international techno management festival organized by ctf besides it is the first fest among its sort in the nation to get a unesco patronage it is an open stage for all the young minds that are thirsty to prove their innovative skills across the globe kurukshetra is an embodiment of energizing events futuristic workshops pioneering project proposals invigorating guest lectures amusing carnivals and so many pieces of stuff in the box the more you know the more you will be enthralled how one can be so multi expertise being a software executive tech strategist innovation evangelist accomplished thought leader agile transformation leader published author and a startup mentor Our Tathagat Verma has trained over 5,000 plus professionals, published 1,000 plus blogs and articles, delivered 500 plus public talks and conferences, and mentored over 100 plus startups. We can't list out all his achievements and contributions within his slot available. Without any further delays, let us welcome with a big round of applause this man of experience on the stage to hear what he has to share with us. <clears throat> Thank you, Nitesh. Uh, can you hear me? Is it coming okay? Yes, sir. Fine. Okay. So let me just bring up my deck, and then I can uh, start uh, talking. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how best I can share the content. Can you see my uh, deck here? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll just make it full screen. All right. Okay, so I hope you can uh, you can still see this. So, 
So thank you, uh, Raghavi, Nitesh, Kavya, and the whole team. And first of all, uh, congratulations to all of you on uh, putting together uh, such a wonderful event and uh, for inviting me. I'm honored to be uh, here with you this afternoon. And I want to share with you some uh, some ways in which how we can make our efforts more creative and our results more uh, inventive. Uh, you are all technical experts, so obviously uh, you, you understand uh, the domain that you are working in, you understand the problem solving methods. I just want to introduce you to um, uh, quickly on one area which will help you to think uh, very differently uh, of some creative ways of doing it. And uh, this method is known as systematic inventive thinking, SIT method. It's a very simple method. Uh, the name sounds a little complex, but uh, when I when I explain you, it will be very simple to understand there. In fact, I will not go through the entire one. I just want to introduce you uh, the five uh, unique uh, ways in which how SIT method can be uh, employed because you will be able to uh, use that much better in your uh, work. So if you really see, um, this is just a random uh, collection of uh, company uh, products and logos. And if you see on the left, uh, you have uh, a bunch of these companies. Uh, maybe you know some of them, maybe you don't know some of them. And then you see on the right hand side, uh, there are companies uh, uh, that are there. Now, the one thing that you will see, what really separates them? And uh, the more you think about this question, the more we, we realize that it is really all about innovation. Uh, the companies on the left were pioneers in their own space, uh, whether it is a Kodak, whether it is a Blockbuster, whether it's a Nokia, whether it's a Blackberry, uh, whether it's a MySpace or Palm Pilot uh, or Yahoo. I used to work at Yahoo once upon a time. Uh, but if you see today, they have all gone out of existence. Uh, they are they are not really seen as, uh, uh, I mean, some of them have disappeared completely. Some of them are trying to rebuild into new areas, but they are not so successful. On the other hand, if you see, uh, if you look at Apple, for example, it has virtually dominated the entire profits uh, in the in the smartphone industry. Uh, if you look at Google or Tesla or Facebook or uh, my favorite here, Dyson's on the. Uh, I think the uh, screen is uh, still on the first page. Oh, is that so? Uh, yes, right. Sir. No. right now it's coming. So I will keep in this one. So I think uh, maybe this will be better. Is that so? Is that okay? Yes, sir. It's better. Okay. Uh, for some reason, sorry about that. For some reason, it is not moving then. Uh, so I guess we will just uh, use this then. Okay. So, um, so, so these are the names. If you see here on the right side, they are more successful. Now, at one point in time, the names on the left were also successful. They were very pioneering products. They were very innovative. What went wrong? Why they were not able to succeed? And the answer might lie in their ability to sustain innovation in their products and services. So how do we really go about innovating? What are some of the uh, what are some of the ways in which uh, we can uh, innovate? Right. So so that is the uh, point that we want to discuss here. So I want to offer you with one idea. Don't worry about reading it. I will be sharing the slides. Uh, so uh, you, I don't want you to read it. Uh, it is only just so that you have uh, the uh, relevant facts when you uh, refer it offline. So one of the things about innovation and creativity is we always say that think outside the box. I'm sure you met somebody who says, hey, think outside the box and you will get the ideas there. Now, the authors of this particular method uh, Drew Boyd and uh, Jack, uh, Jacob uh, Goldberg, they they feel that ideas are all inside the box. You don't have to really go outside the box. The creative ideas are inside the box. And, and the box is really something you are saying that, hey, I'm, I'm really thinking of my problem inside this frame. And that's how you see that. And then they say that uh, SIT method is actually harnessing only five patterns. They say majority of the innovation by mankind over thousands of years can only be summarized in these five thinking patterns. Uh, and, and everything else is really a combination of one or two of those patterns there. Right. So it sounds very interesting that what are those uh, five patterns there? 
Uh, and uh, the names of these patterns are subtraction, division, multiplication, task unification, and attribute dependency. I'll explain all of them, what it really means there. So if you think of this method itself, SIT has been around for quite some time, for at least last 20, 25 years, and it has been applied uh, in thousands of organizations. And you see some, some big names here. I mean, names like Philips or British Petroleum or SAP or Hewlett Packard or uh, Johnson and Johnson. So it has been applied in multiple type of industries and multiple countries. So what are the principles of SIT? I will I will uh, take I'll talk briefly about uh, these six principles and then we will talk about the five patterns here. So the first principle it talks about is what we call as a fixedness, which means in our mind we think that hey this is really meant for X Y Z purpose and we are not able to change that thinking. But the but the most innovative ideas come when we are able to break that fixedness. So for example. Uh, let us say I might uh, I might say that uh, this is a pen, right? I mean, so so you can see that this is a ball pen, and I might say that hey, this is a ball pen, and this is really meant for you know, writing. Uh, but now, if I if I challenge you and say, can you think of some other usage of that? Can you think of a, a pen that does not write, or maybe a pen does something else, for example? that would be breaking the fixedness, right? So the idea is that cognitive fixedness, that means in our mind, we have a very fixed notion that this is what it is meant for. And I'm sure as a children, as a child, all of us have solved these problems, right? I mean, uh, uh, like if you see on the extreme right, uh, you have to join nine circles in four straight lines without, uh, uh, without, uh, uh, without removing your pen, right? Four continuous lines. And the problem is not so simple, but the moment you realize that you can literally think and have some imaginary circles and, and draw around it, you are able to solve it, right? So you are changing your fixedness in your mind. Or for example, the elephant has how many legs? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an optical illusion that you are not able to see. Or this very famous candle experiment that Carl Dunker did in 1945. What he did was he gave this um, uh, a candle, a matchbox, and a and a lot of thumb tacks. And he said, "I want you to to uh, to put this candle on the wall in such a manner that the wax does not drip down." Now people can try multiple ways. So you they can see that they have thumb tacks. So they start putting the candle on the wall. They start putting the thumb tacks, or they light it up and and rub the side of it so that it becomes soft. And they try to stick it to the wall. They try all these kind of a things, but they don't succeed. And then in another experiment, what Carl did was he removed these uh, 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 tucks from the box and he kept them separately. And then suddenly people actually saw that, hey, the box is not meant as a container for these thumb tags. The box can be used by itself. And the percentage of people who were then able to solve the problem, it rose dramatically. Because what they did was they actually attached the box to the wall using the thumb tags and they put the lit landel in that. So anything that was coming out as a wax, it came down in the box itself. Now, this is a simple illustration of how our brain works. We, we fall into the patterns and it's very difficult to break the patterns and that is what really hampers our creativity. So how do we kind of, uh, and there could be multiple types of fixedness. We can think of a functional fixedness. So for example, if we think of a bicycle, uh, we think the bicycle is only meant for, uh, uh, let us say taking going from a point a to the point b but what if somebody can say that maybe the bicycle can be reimagined for something else right uh, i'm sure you have seen uh, uh, those uh, 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 the people who come for example to sharpen the knives now we don't see a lot of them in the cities anymore or we see other people who, who have actually used the bicycle to build a, a a wheel in which they are basically sharpening the knives right so they are breaking the fixedness from functional to something else, or it could be a structural uh, fixedness. So for example, you are uh, you, you think that, uh, for example, you might say that a glass of, uh, uh, a, a bottle of water should only be of that particular shape. Now it does not have to be like that. I'm sure many of you have seen those uh, slim bottles, right? A vertically slim bottle, and, and it doesn't look like the regular bottle, but you are trying to break the structural fixedness of that. And then finally, it could be a relational fixedness, which is the relationship between two objects, how they, they might uh, connect with each other. Now, 
while i'm giving simple examples a lot of them you will be able to connect to the technical solutions so if you think of a electronic payment or you can think of an email or you can think of a website you can you keep thinking in the back of your mind because then that way you are able to apply it much much better the second thing they talk about is that path of most resistance now i'm sure in science you have all read the principle of path of least resistance right when we learn physics we always think of that there is a path of least resistance and that is really what is leading to the solution now what they what they say is that you actually come up with a creative way when you follow the path of most resistance and not really the least resistance because least resistance is a very simple it's a very intuitive way of doing it but if you want to think of the counter intuitive way then you have to think of a path of most resistance there so that's a the principle they uh, talk of then uh, they talk of a very interesting idea they call as a closed world principle um, and what they say in a closed world principle is that essentially you think of whatever you have in some kind of a closed world boundary and only solve the problem with that so for example uh, in the picture as you will see suppose you are going in your car and you have a flat tire and then you realize that the lug nuts are rusted so you are not able to remove those lug nuts so what are the options for you to solve the problem well one might argue you might take your phone out and you might call the garage people and they will come and tow your car but the phone is not part of that closed world of the car you have to think inside the car whatever is there only that can be used to solve the problem and it so happens that we have these uh, uh, the jack and the wrench set and if you see that this this arrangement might look a little uh, uh, crazy but you can actually you, you can end, actually put them together so that you raise the jack and then you put the wrench here and then as you raise it it keeps loosening the lug nut so that's one way of thinking how it can be solved it but the key idea is to think in the boundaries of the problem that we are solving there's another interesting point that they bring which is the function follows the form now that's a very counter intuitive idea a lot of times we say form follows function if you talk to any designer they will say form follows function so if i want a pen i want a pen which i can hold it in my in my fingers and hence the form so so the form really evolves uh, around that so the function is there and the form evolves now what they say is that the function follows the form which is again a counter intuitive thinking because they say that depending on the form factor the function kind of evolves it now again you'll have to uh, spend some time to immerse yourself in this way of thinking but just hold that idea for now now how do we kind of uh, look at uh, these five tools there right so these are the five tools and let me talk about them in a, in a minute each then uh, we can have a core part of something but you remove something and then you build a new product out of it so for example if you think of a exercise cycle right what is an exercise cycle an, an exercise cycle is essentially a bicycle where you have removed the front wheel and hence it cannot move and now you are imagining that what can it what ki what kind of an interesting thing can it do so you are able to think of uh, an exercise cycle there right or for example look at the soup soup powder well if you if you buy your favorite uh, maggi soup or, or or nor soup or something now what is a soup powder a soup powder is essentially if you think logically it is water that has been removed from it and by removing the water what you are left with is just the powder of that and that powder can now be packaged and it can be preserved a much longer period of time it is much easier to transport as well so it actually builds a very new category of products by simply remove or for example take the contact lenses now what is a contact lens essentially the glasses where you have removed the frame and push the glasses inside on the eye uh, retina right so that is yet another way to think of a subtraction or for example you think of uh, the bookstore right uh, when when uh, amazon started they were saying we are we are at the earth's biggest bookstore where is the bookstore there is no bookstore really right i mean that's the whole idea you might think that the bookstore should have a bookshop where you can buy the books but then there is no bookshop here so you are building something interesting for example uh, uh, dyson actually came up with this very interesting idea of having a vacuum cleaner without a bag now it was a very revolutionary idea when dyson started working on it how can you have a vacuum cleaner without a bag and that was up in game level so this could be a very interesting way to think of how you look at subtraction uh, as one of the uh, patterns the second pattern is division
when you talk along a physical or a temporal space so temporal as in time and rearrange it back into the product so t- take the case of uh, yeah, here below right uh, and this may not be so common nowadays but 20 years back it was very common so we had cars to uh, stereos right so the car stereo was basically uh, and there the, the biggest problem was that there was a lot of car theft so people used to break in the car and they used to steal the car stereos. What they came up with a very interesting solution uh, was that you have a front panel that can be removed. So you remove the front panel and you put in a in a in a hard case and then you carry along with that. So now nothing of value is really left in the car because the front panel is the real thing there and that is with you. So that is how you look at the division part of it. Or uh, if you look at a remote control. What is a remote control? Again, 30 years back uh, when we had the televisions just come in, we had all the volume knobs and all the controls on the television, right? So, But you had to walk up to the television to basically change the volume or change the channel. So what they did was they basically said, okay, what is the opportunity for us to remove this entire uh, set of controls into a separate form factor and build a remote control here? So that is how the remote control uh, really helps us. Or look at even the printer cartridges. If printer cartridges, if the cartridges were imagined as a part of the printer, it would be so difficult to to basically replace them because we'll have to take the entire printer. But now you have an opportunity to think of that, hey, printer cartridges is a separate part. I can really remove it and change it. Even the whole notion of EMIs, right, uh, which started uh, back in 50s or 60s in the US, uh, buy later, buy today, pay later. So you are buying today, but instead of paying for it today, you are separating it out. So you might say, I'll pay after two months or three months or six months. And then it allows you to buy things which otherwise may not be possible there, right? So that's an interesting way to think of how you can bring two things kind of category. The third category is uh, what we call as multiplication. And multiplication is an interesting idea. So what you do is you take something which is already there and you, you make a copy of that. So you make one or more copies of that and you don't simply copy and say one more is there you actually make some changes in a very interesting manner so if you think of um, uh, take the case of a tricycle what is a tricycle a tricycle is essentially a bicycle for children where instead of the back wheel being one we have we have multiplied that with two wheels and now they have a slightly different purpose because they are able to provide the stability they are able to help the children so that they don't fall down it becomes a very interesting way to think suddenly of new possibilities or for example if you look at uh, the phone camera the front camera and the back camera right they have different purposes there they have a different resolution it's not exactly the same thing that has been done even the uh, the uh, gillette uh, razor for example you might have seen like 10 years back they had a blade with uh, a razor with three blades then they came up with four blades then they came up with five blades now somebody might say they are just adding one more blade after after 10 years they will have 10 blades there but, but if you think of it and if you read about the, the the research that has gone in they they are not exactly same they are at a different angle and they have done a lot of research and really saying how the angle of the blade really makes it more effective uh, and that's the whole idea there uh, my favorite are these two which is like this uh, febreze so what they what they started uh, looking at was when they when they gave these room fresheners they the people said hey after a while the room freshener becomes very we get very used to that and it is not uh, very interesting so what they did was they actually created instead of one room freshener there were two of them basically of two different flavors so what happened was just when you start getting used to a, a flavor a, a particular aroma or fragrance then the second one uh, takes over so then there is a change and you start feeling that hey this is a new product there and it's not the same old boring thing right and then this is a very interesting one capro Uh, capro tools is really uh, i think it's from israel and very interestingly if you see here those who are from mechanical engineering would probably know that that there is a spirit level here that you can see now it is not having one spirit level it actually has three spirit levels and many of their products have even more spirit levels how does it help well the basic idea is same as a spirit level it tells you the uh, tells you whether it is a straight line uh, horizontal or vertical or so on but it actually allows the masons and the and the home builders to think of the surfaces and the edges that are more correctly aligned 
rather than assuming because it's only in one di- direction there, right? So those kind of things, or even cake, you can think of that instead of one cake, you make cupcakes. So cupcakes is another idea to think of a multiplication uh, sort of a thing. What about task? The fourth one is task unification. Now, as you can imagine from the word, unification is essentially bringing it together. So what was meant to be different things, you are then building it together. Uh, Think of a Swiss knife. What does a Swiss knife do? It brings a lot of those utility items together. Or some of you might have seen uh, Steve Jobs' first presentation of iPhone 1 launch. If you have not seen it, I would strongly recommend taking an hour and listening to this video. Uh, because in that, he said basically it is, it, is, it is an iPod, it is a phone, it is an internet, and then spin into one. Right, and that was again a very powerful way of unifying it all together in one uh, one form factor, essentially. Or, for example, you might think of these kind of maker. You have a um, you have a grill, you have a toaster, you have a heater, you have all the things together, right? You might also see the fans, which nowadays have an electric light with them. So there are multiple ways of thinking about it. Uh, and then lastly. Uh, uh, you can think of a very interesting way in which something that we call as attribute dependency. And what is an attribute dependency? Uh, is that there is certain behavior of a product or a service, but after it crosses a threshold, then the, the whole correlation or the behavior of them changes. Uh, let me explain that. So, for example, I'm sure all of us at some point in time we have we have ordered pizza and then we uh, nowadays they have stopped doing it because they think it is it causes accidents but there used to be a time when there was this 30 minutes of free so people are waiting okay if 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 it if the pizza comes after 30 minutes it's going to be pay for it right that kind of a thing or pizza hut had this kind of a, a dot here if that dot was uh, black that means the food was still hot inside uh, but if the if the dot was not black that means the food has gone cold and they will give a free replacement um, or for example think of the sunglasses the shades which change uh, the uh, if the sunlight is more than the the photochromatic ones for example uh, or even the alarm clock that gets uh, uh, more more louder if you don't uh, listen to it or maybe in pub for example you have the happy hours so after seven up seven o'clock you have a one plus one free right or in some countries they actually had this kind of a thing where uh, if, if if women came there uh, were uh, wearing uh, high heels they gave them a discount so maybe that was their own way of promoting uh, some fun or something like that right i mean we cannot adopt it in every cultural context uh, but or you might have seen the coffee mugs for example which if there is a cold water it remains uh, black but if there is a hot water you can have the logo come out of that right so there are multiple ways to really think of it now if you think of all these five ways of really doing it, then you might be able to really come back and really build and think of a virtual product. So you say, hey, what if it, what if, if I do the X, Y, Z together and then come and see what will it happen? And that's what they call as a virtual product. You have not created a product mind. And now the whole idea is that you are going to test it and really see whether do you think it makes sense. And that is where you basically look at this principle, uh, the principle being basically function follows the form. So now you have already mentally thought of a product. You have built a form factor by saying, OK, I will think of a bicycle. I will remove the front wheel and let's see what can come out of it. So you are now thinking uh, the form is already there. What will be the function possibilities coming out of it? And then you have some kind of a uh, problem solving method. So let's say you start with an existing situation. So you have a website or you have a product or you are building something. Uh, you 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 come out you, you say let me apply some thinking tools what are the thinking tools you have subtraction task unification division multiplication and attribute dependency you you build a vir- virtual product out of it and then you say hey there is a market filter out of it and then you say hey there is a market filter does it even make sense should be really built it is there a market need for it that it can basically address it and then if you think that there is a market need then you basically look at the implementation and technology and say hey can we even do it? Is it feasible? Are there is the technology available to do that? And then you basically adapt, and that's how the idea comes out of the whole thing. So if you think about it, 
you basically are able to think of the whole innovation process in a very systematic manner and that's why they call it as a systematic inventive thinking otherwise a, a very common pattern that i see is that i know blockchain or i know java or i know ai and then i build something but i don't know what problem i am solving and then it it becomes what i call as solution in search of a problem uh, kind of a thing right so those are the uh, things and i hope uh, uh, I have given the references there. I will also share this link uh, with Raghavi and, and team so that they, you can look it up on uh, SlideShare. Uh, but uh, I hope this is of uh, some uh, some help to all of you. Uh, I will stop sharing uh, the screen if I can. Uh, and I don't know how do I kind of do that. But uh, I hope this is the one. Yeah, I guess so. So I hope uh, it was uh, helpful. I hope it was helpful for uh, all of you. But if we have time uh, here, Nitesh, then I, I can take a few questions. Uh, yes, sure, sir. Uh, guys, uh, please put in your, type in your questions in the chat box. So the one thing I just add about these methods is that you can apply them anywhere. It doesn't have to be physical products. It They have applied it to electronic products. They have applied to mechanical products. They have applied it to healthcare products, applied it to a bunch of uh, very wide things. So, but the key thing is really think of it like a, uh, like a uh, way of solving problems. And you already know the technology, you already know the domain in which you are doing, but think, think of applying this filter to basically think of how you would um, uh, think of creative ways. I don't know if there are any questions, but uh, OK, I see one or two of them. Uh, apart from Dyson, where have you seen some ingenious ideas executed in a really good manner? Well, Dyson is one company, and if you, if you look at the way Dyson really innovates in their products. I mean, I, I, I'm a personally a big fan of how they come up with these uh, ingenious ideas there. But uh, I'm sure all of you have your own favorite ones. Uh, you, you, some people might find the, the whole, uh, some people might find the Android uh, ecosystem as very creative because it allows anyone to uh, innovate. Some people might find the Apple iOS ecosystem as better because there is a very high bar on uh, on the security and the uh, and the design and other things there. So it really depends on what your need is. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, Apple is, a, for, for me personally, if I have to think of something, Apple is a great example of that. Or if you think of our payment solutions, right? I mean, if you think of, let us say, phone pay, uh, I will talk of phone pay because I work for Walmart and phone pay is a part of uh, Walmart, right? So, so phone pay is a great way, right? You don't have to worry about thinking it is just click 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 and you are done there are seconds there so it really de depends on you but i would really encourage you to think hard and say what are the products that really inspire you and what are the products that you don't like so i'll give you an example uh, just today it happened i was actually i had ordered uh, i will not name them because I, that is not right for me to embarrass them but a very prominent furniture maker i had ordered a uh, study table and it came three days back and today that uh, service technician came to install it we opened it and it was all broken from inside. The experience of that one that I'm now thinking whether I really want to do that or not. So, so obviously you have to think about all those uh, kind of a things. So everyone has their favorite, but think about what really, why do you think they are they are the ones that you like? So, and that will give you some insight. Second one was, uh, can you share one of the major problems according to you still unsorted prevailing in e-commerce in India? So I'll give you one example, uh, which is there. Uh, in e-commerce, one of the bigger, uh, one of the problems, so two two problems that have to be called as a uh, cart abandonment. That means what happens is uh, you go to the e-commerce retail site, you start, uh, you log in there, uh, you start putting things in your cart, right? So you take uh, uh, pencil, you take sharpener, you take this, you take that, and then you come to the point of checkout, and at the point of checkout, you just abandon your journey. So for whatever reason. Either you you got distracted, or uh, you think the pricing was 
not transparent or you think that the delivery time was too long there could be n number of reasons for that but card abandonment is a very very big problem in the e-commerce uh, industry because all the effort that you are doing in really marketing your products and building the right kind of an experience it goes uh, uh, it goes away so that's one thing uh, second problem is the returns so for example returns is something which actually creates a creates a huge problem on return logistics so uh, your favorite e-commerce might say hey we will give a free uh, a refund or a free replacement if you send if the if you're not happy with the product and a lot of people essentially misuse it or a lot of people might say uh, hey this is my size was not right and and many a times it's a size right if you say hey it is one size too big or one size too small and you send it there so so that can become a big problem there if you if you are thinking of building an e-commerce solution it might be a great idea for you to think of some of these and say well these are the consumer problems that are facing how can i change it can i give some way of comfort that there is a higher chances that uh, people are going to pick up the right product there even the third problem i will say which is related to the machine learning and some of you might be working in machine learning is uh, is the whole recommendation so a lot of times when you buy something you see people who bought this also bought this and 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 then and and then the system the e-commerce is basically the, the system is recommending you some items but majority of it, of the times people don't buy more than let's say 5% of these items so now you are in a situation where you are doing so many things if you are able because the cost of acquiring a new customer is much higher compared to the cost of retaining a customer but if the customer is buying more active more items then you can serve them better but if your if your prediction accuracy is only 5% accuracy is only 5% then it's very difficult for you to think of it so maybe if you are able to improve some of them that might be a great opportunity to think of it three things uh, i would pick it up um importance of uh, user experience design and products absolutely everything else looks the same i mean if you look at your smartphones they all look the same but why did you choose the one that you have even the price points are similar for the kind of ram or for the kind of um, uh, display that you have but certain comfort you feel that hey this is like i can feel it it's a part of me right and that experience is very difficult to articulate there uh, then we have a question here is ai and ml going to reach peak in future or is that some already in the peak i think the next 10 years if you look at the data points there is a lot of growth that's going to happen in machine learning there is a lot of growth that so i want i won't necessarily call it as artificial intelligence per se but let me just call it as machine learning because in my mind there are two different things here even though machine learning is a subset of that uh, and in fact my phd topic is relating to the adoption of ai so that's something that i'm uh, the industry trends uh, the industry projections are that we are looking at a 15 trillion dollar economy across the globe in the next 10 to 15 years so that is a kind of opportunity that you all have in the coming time uh, however you have to be careful because uh, th there are a lot of issues that are coming up in terms of ethical issues ethical usage of artificial intelligence uh, i'm sure all of you have read articles that talk about how the the whole issue of segregation based on gender or based on race or based on skin color or based on many other factors right it has now earlier it was okay because in e-commerce we just talk about and say people who bought this also bought this so it's not a big deal but imagine if you you if 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 somebody you know went to the hospital and the hospital actually looked at their diagnosis and said oh th this one is basically not so serious so i will not recommend uh, this in uh, this treatment we will recommend a smaller treatment the only reason that happened because of the less amount of training data that was available there now that is a real issue there because there is a liability issue there is a health and safety issue and there is a life uh, uh, threat issue there so uh, or for example look at the self driving cars there have been accidents with the self driving cars where um, the car did not recognize somebody who had a darker skin crossing the road in the in the evening hours right now that's again a big problem because the training data that was given was given uh, basically looking at uh, uh, a lot of uh, white male for example and and the moment it was basically from male to female there was a lot of uh, uh, translation error the, the moment it went from a white to a black it again became a big problem there so there are multiple challenges that we have 
I would urge all of you to think of those solutions and not just build yet another way to sell soaps or shampoos on the net, but really find some meaningful problems that will help the humanity at large. How can we help India at large by building a better uh, uh, training data so that our models will have more value in the coming time? I think I have a question here. Happy to see you. Thank you, Swami. Which technology will be booming for next five to 10 years? So I think definitely I can say next five to 10 years, all the digital technologies are going to rule the roost. So what do I mean by that? IoT, blockchain, big data, AI, machine learning. Uh, so these are the ones which will really help us because we are get, getting more and more of these. And I think we are really getting to the point maybe in another decade, we will start talking about quantum computing in a bigger way. We are already seeing that I think IIC Bangalore has started a course in quantum computing and I'm sure many other places are starting those kind of courses now. So it's becoming there and I think over a period of time we will see the new wave which seems to be quantum computing. But for now, I would put my money on the whole digital technologies in terms of uh, the, the entire digital stack that I talked about here. Uh, Thank you. What do you think about cloud technology? Uh, definitely a very compelling value proposition because it gives you the whole opportunity to not only look at optimizing your uh, uh, IT resources. It also nowadays, uh, I mean, I'm sure with COVID you have seen, we are all sitting anywhere else and there could be people who are accessing your infrastructure either as employees or as customers anytime, anywhere, right? So how do you really make sure that you can fulfill that promise? Uh, if you have everything on-prem, you might have challenges in terms of providing it, or you might have latency problems or security issues, but the cloud technology has really, really come up very well. Uh, when I say cloud, it is not just uh, cloud computing alone. I think we, we are also seeing new use cases of edge computing coming because, for example, uh, like in, like uh, a, a case like, uh, for example, uh, a retail company like us, for example, now you have so many stores and so many warehouses and distribution centers, you, you also need to recognize that there might be an opportunity to even think of an edge computing use case to basically uh, kind of uh, look at them. So that could be an opportunity to look at. Uh, or for example, edge AI is another thing which is coming there. So when you are looking at a fleet of self-driving cars, you need to have, so people are talking about edge computing, artificial intelligence, and 5G all coming together. The re reason being, when you have the self-driving cars, you have the car which is like a one of the millions of cars on the network, and it has to have a, a real-time ability to make artificially intelligent decisions there. Now, 5G will definitely help, but we need robust 5G networks for that. We also need the ability to process a lot of that artificial intelligence locally. So there is a lot of need. So I think those are some of the things I personally find very interesting that these use cases will uh, will come handy there. Uh, I have Nitish, I don't know how much more time I have, uh, but uh, tell me if, if I'm done. I don't want to take away uh, other time. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your inspiring uh, thoughts. So we could get many uh, insights from you. So thank you so much for that, sir. Thank you, Nitish. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Raghavi, for uh, inviting me. And uh, wish you all the best. I will share the uh, deck on SlideShare, and I'll share the link so you can you can follow up from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was truly an interesting and informative session from you. Now, let us gear up to call one among the top 10 Indian data scientists listed in 2019. Ms. Muthumari S., Sub-Business Unit Head at Vilio, is a seasonal analytics professional with a decade of experience in enabling better decision making for sales and marketing functions across industries. With over 10 years of experience in delivering AI and ML use cases at scale across customer, product and marketing, NLP and vision analytics, Ms. Mutamari works with CXOs in enabling their organizations to make accurate data-driven decisions as well as solve ambiguous problems involving unstructured text or image and machine-generated data with tangible business impact. Now, we feel honored to invite our guest speaker, Ms. Mutumari, to deliver a great talk about her mind-blowing skills.
I'm not able to unmute myself. Hey, can you? I'm going to turn on your phone. I'm not able to unmute myself. Oh, okay. Can hear voice, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, it's it's very special for me to be here also because in 2007, um, you know, I was part of the volunteer, uh, you know, committee when uh, we just started uh, Kurukshetra. So it feels so special to see that, uh, you know, Kurukshetra is still continuing and, uh, you know, you guys are doing a fabulous job. So I'm so honored to be back to our own very own College of Engineering Gindi where I have passed out uh, in 2008. Um, so I'll just get started. So I'm going to talk to you guys about my journey in data science and uh, tell you what I wished I knew when I was in college and uh, maybe, you know, I would have speeded up my career, but of course, no regrets. Uh, let me share my screen and go on to like the basics. Sorry, guys, I've been, uh, you know, having some trouble <laughs> connecting. So just give me a minute. I, I should be up in a second. Yeah, I think you can see my screen now. Um, uh, can someone just confirm since I've been like on and off of audio? Is it fine? Yes, my screen yes, is fine. Okay. Finally, finally, I'm up. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah. So I'm Mutu, I'm heading the data science uh, team within uh, Brilio Analytics. Uh, what happened again? Oh yeah, uh, I have around 12 plus years of experience in uh, data science and these are my interest areas. Of course, you know, problem solving, digital marketing, mathematics, data science. Uh, I also recently got recognized as uh, one of the 40 under 40 data scientists this year, 2021. And um, these are, of course, my interest areas like music. Uh, I remember starting uh, this music club called Hans when we were in Siege. I don't know if it still exists. Uh, would definitely love to connect with uh, people who are still doing it. Uh, I do a lot of playing. Uh, you know, of course, you know, watch a lot of things on Netflix, Prime, etc. Uh, yeah. So coming back to this topic of why artificial intelligence has become so important right it has been there for you know many many decades but uh, why has it you know boomed suddenly uh, i'm just going to give you guys my perspective right uh, so one is that um, the infrastructure that is available today 
for us to um, you know the convert the human capabilities or or undertake that in a software inexpensively and at scale right um, so this whole part of inexpensiveness and scale i believe are really uh, contributing to why there is so much hype in this space over the last uh, decade or so uh, with the invent of cloud and with the invent of other technologies that are enabling us to track a lot of data points that never used to exist uh, you know at least a few decades back is uh, definitely contributing as well now ai can be applied to every sector to enable new possibilities and efficiencies um you know sir very nicely uh, mr sharma spoke about autonomous vehicles uh, i've also been involved in uh, you know some of the projects related to autonomous vehicles where there are multiple uh, you know things that we are analyzing right the first step is for us to annotate the images detect what objects are you know visible for uh, a video uh, we also in deduction polyline deduction there are like multitudes of minor use cases that are also in place uh, auto automated medical diagnosis right today uh, you know with covid we are able to you know go much faster because of the technology that we have today and a uh, lot of things like even for example tracing uh, diagnosis a lot of things are automated using uh, technologies like ocr and uh, optimization techniques intelligent agents right whenever uh, you know we have any issues uh, we are not necessarily talking to a physical person uh, we also have a lot of rise in chatbots and intelligent agents who are trying to address our queries without really you know getting into uh, uh, you know the kind of experience that we used to have uh, you know before before all of these uh, things happened and of course you know enhanced data synthesis and decision making uh, which is also happening right now um i'm just going to talk about like the five broad categories right the first one being the knowledge the ability to represent knowledge about the world reasoning the ability to solve problems that is you know uh, logical and uh, that makes sense it it is also helping us in planning uh, the ability to set and achieve the goals uh, for example in in supply chain if you see there are a lot of uh, you know uh, Uh, data science techniques that we apply to understand what kind of products that uh, people are going to buy what kind of inventory do we stock up at you know every kind of warehouse where should the warehouse even be present what are the sku's that people might buy right for example um during covid you know suddenly there was a spike in demand for like say masks uh, for sanitizers these are like the new things that came into picture and uh, with with data we had lot of projects where we had to analyze and understand where do you stock up more what kind of uh, sanitizers what kind of skus are people you know going to buy for in which which location so where do you you know uh, place the warehouses so that you are able to meet the demand on time um those are some of the example and of course communication right uh, ability to understand the written and spoken language this is this is something that i have done multiple projects especially you know in the uh, healthcare domain um so you know lot of times uh, people are trying to synthesize multiple language uh, in documents that are written we are trying to make sense of things and in these cases while uh, aws are trying to solve all this problem with their cognitive services there are there is still a lot of room for us to do uh, you know manual uh, algorithm changes as well and uh, fifth one of course is the perception right ability to make deductions about the world based on the sensory input um so here i just try to you know uh, break the five points into the different kinds of examples that we just spoke about knowledge of course uh, you know medical diagnosis consumer targeting right um, like for example um, when you guys go to any of the e-commerce websites you um, you know like just get in you're just engaging with a, a particular product or a listing you have made your decision as to whether you are going to make the purchase or not and then you come out and most of you would have noticed that after you come out a lot wherever you go you will be followed up with the ad where um you know you will like have crying smileys very cute uh, campaigns that uh, i have seen mintra has done that to me uh, try to make me come back to the purchase uh, right so 
uh, all of these are data driven all of these are done by you know the algorithms that we are writing in the back end uh, reasoning games legal analysis um, autonomous weapons compliance again planning i think uh, we spoke about the demand forecasting predictive maintenance predictive maintenance is something that uh, as especially you know taken a, a large large uh, you know uh, place after covid um, most of the factories uh, that you know that i was probably engaged in over the last 12 years were not uh, coming forward to completely digitize their uh, you know systems right so but with the whole lockdown and uh, the kind of you know environment that uh, got in created this is definitely taking a, a step in front and uh, it it's not going away for the next 10 years for sure um communication of course the intelligent agents customer support perception again we spoke about a couple of things here so um this is another thing that i just wanted to clarify uh, and because a lot of people use these words interchangeably so uh, i just wanted to clarify this and then we will spend most of our time in machine i mean in data science where uh, i come from and i'm going to give you guys some tips on how you can get into this field as well ai is a much broader space right where uh, when i was talking about um, why ai is important i would have mentioned about the human capabilities undertaken uh, uh, you know in software right so this is a much broader thing beyond what we do in machine learning or what we you know do in data science right machine learning is a subset of uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning is even uh, you know even smaller and and this is also one of the you know upcoming fields that is coming up and um, data science is something that is going to cut across all of this and it, it it does not fall into this whole bucket itself so what exactly is data science right like the way i explain it is it's the study of data to explain what has happened and predicting what might potentially happen like this is this is like the simplest way of explaining how data science cuts across um data science is respond responsible for being as inquisitive as possible with a data set in hand to make the weirdest of business connections like day in and day out this is this is my job right we we have like tons of data we have a, we have tons of problem statements so it's all about connecting the dots and uh, you know getting those tons of insights that lie unnoticed in the massive chunks of data that we are collecting from you know different portals different devices and from different consumers and customers and that sheds new light on the areas like customer behavior customer behavior is is the most you know like uh, often used uh, field you know like data science problems are at scale in cu customer behavior and and this is something that has been happening even before you know deep learning and machine learning became you know so uh, famous at this point operational shortcomings supply chain cycles predictive analysis and more um so before we go in right I, i'll just uh, talk about what i believe machine learning is right machine learning is the ability given to the system to learn and process the data sets autonomously without human intervention that is how you know uh, i see machine learning and data science to be slightly different and um, this is how you know the the data scientists typically do right because a lot of times uh, people get a perception that uh, you just write you know algorithms right no that is just one part or or i would say that's the easiest part of uh, the entire job uh, if you see like we have to definitely deal with the data right because um, the, most of the time the data that we get are not going to be in a very structured way so you have to make it in a way that uh, you are able to understand that you are able to make sense of and follow patterns with and then statistics you will need to understand say if you're going to apply a algorithm you need to understand you know the very basic of um, you know what kind of assumptions does this algorithm going to hold on to and you have to like really go and check whether this makes sense or not um machine learning of course you know um you have like tons and tons of uh, algorithms that are available uh, which you can apply on 
visualization right um, this is this is very very important right after data analysis i think visualization is one more thing that i consider as the most important step because um you can build cool stuff you can do many things but unless we are able to visually story tell what exactly we are able to do i think all the things that we would have done will go a waste so a lot of times um, you know when we don't build a product like a recommendation engine or a, or a object reduction most of the time we are trying to tell a story we are trying to bring out the insights or empower people who are going to make decisions in all those scenarios visualizations become very very important and of course data mining is uh, it, it's something that we do like in 70% of any data science project will go into data mining um and of course the the broader things are you know the uh, soft skills that uh, we typically deal with right coding is definitely non negotiable but you should also have creativity you should have very good subject matter uh, expertise right when we say subject matter expertise what uh, you know what i mean is um, say for example if you are uh, working with uh, e-commerce problem then you need to understand uh, you need to start with say how does this company make money what are the products that are there why is this project important how are they going to uh, consume the insights or whatever results that i'm going to get from this project right maybe the results could be integrated with uh, the app itself or you know sometimes uh, if the insights will be used by a company c cxos to make a decision so you need to understand how it is going to be consumed and a lot of times all of these things could change just working on a recommendation engine uh, you know project for a e-commerce company um like even after we decided that this is going to be integrated with the product right there are like different layers of consumers for whom you will want to you know um, orchestrate their journey in a different way so the techniques will change the kind of data points to, that you have with the customer will change say if it's a cold start problem like say if a consumer comes into your website for the first time you don't have any data about him right so the technique that we used to handle a cold start problem will be very different so um depending on how your data is going to be used what kind of data is available for the problem that you're going to solve for all of these things will change so having that critical thinking to um, and and of course creativity to understand how you're going to frame this problem that you're going to solve is you know like 50% of uh, what that project is going to be right the complexity of the project is going to lie on how you will turn a business problem into the data science project that you're going to deliver so all of these skills are extremely important so this is how a typically uh, how we do projects right like i said the first step is problem formulation and data discovery so um in this step what i typically do is uh, do something like a design thinking workshop where we pull in you know different stakeholders and talk about the pain points right um most of the time we are doing uh, to you know reach a okr so okr is also another thing that you will hear when you join any company right um this is like your goal of what is it that i'm trying to change in this project what is it that i'm trying to improve in this project so um for example you know uh, if if they have a problem statement that hey i want to improve my customers experience that they are seeing in my product by um, say you know uh, 20% by 30% now how are you going to uh, you know like translate that into a okr this by understanding how do i convert this whole experience into what are the kpis that are going to be tagged what are the okrs that are going to be tagged as consumer experience it, it could be how much time you are spending in the web website it could be what is the rating that you are giving after every purchase it could be uh, how you have rated the app the product the store it could be many factors right so um that is like the first step that we typically try to understand how are you going to measure the customer experience and what is the needle that you want to move right because um with uh, without a goal it, 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 all of these steps are going to uh, go for a toss and of course data discovery right so i might want to solve like like 100 product you need to prioritize based on um, you know like for example 
in this whole customer engagement itself i might come but i need to check whether um, you know i have enough data to do or execute the 10 ideas that i have and the second point is uh, say for example i do that and i figure that i i can only execute five ideas and five, for the rest of the five ideas i don't have the data we haven't started collecting or we needed like at least three years data but we have only like one year data which is not sufficient for us to run a model so it could be many factors now let, let's say for example after doing all this i have now five ideas right now among the five five ideas say i have money to execute only two two of my projects so now in this scenario you will look at how you will prioritize is which of these ideas can i do a quick win or a, or a quick mvp and how much of value it is going to generate for um, you know my my business stakeholder right so say for example for example uh, my idea one could probably take you know 8 weeks for me to deliver and say i'm going to reach at least 80% of my goal in uh, my first mvp itself then that's like a no brainer if if you know it's higher as compared to the other ideas right most of the time that will not be the case but just for today's uh, talk i was giving you guys an example um so based on those criteria we will select the problem that we want to solve for then data acquisition a lot of times um like you might ask as to why am i doing data acquisition once i've already done a discovery right so now in the discovery phase you are just going to see whether i have the data where is it um, is it enough for me to do this analysis how am i going to join all these things that is the discovery that you're going to do in this phase it's all about thinking ppts excels workshops mind maps that's all you will do here in this is this is the phase where you're going to like actually get your hands dirty with the data right so this is like the most important step uh in the project because if your data quality is bad if you have built your data bad none of this are going to be valid right so it is the most important step in a uh, in a in a you know a data science project so in this part you will uh, here is where you will use all your data structure knowledge data warehousing knowledge that uh, you are all you know studying or probably going to study in the next 2 uh, to 3 years so here you will get everything uh, together in one place you will uh, use your sql queries or you will use python fispark whatever technology to create whatever uh, feature stores or uh, data marts based on how you're going to build the architecture for executing this project now once you're done with this then you go to the model build or the algorithm build right so you most of the time it will um, it, it's a it's a exercise that you will have to do multiple times right so the way we call it is uh, iterations and uh, now in the cloud ml language they call it model experimentation right um the there are multiple ways of uh, you know testing whether this is working or not one is definitely in stage number 3 you will quantitatively see whether your algorithm is performing well in the data that you have chosen to sure. deliver this project but um and this is and you will of course test it on the validation data set you will do multiple types of you know uh, k fold uh, validation etc right but here is also uh, another you know kinds of testing that are required like for example if uh, this whole recommendation engine um, example that i gave you guys here um statistically uh, you have methods but none of them are really proven right so now there are different ways for you to prove it and for you to test it right you will uh, so typically what we do is in a in a very uh, wicked problem that uh, you can't really take a guess or that is just overfitting in your data uh, right we will try to run experiments with uh, you know smaller set of consumers that we believe are going to work out right so here we here we will do some ab testing multivariate testing uh, by you know testing it out with a sample set of consumers to see how they are reacting to the new set of features that we are introducing or the change in the algorithm uh, you know how it is performing directly with the consumers so in between that of course there will be your uh, software tests as well like uh, you will do negative tests you will do you know all kinds of your performance tests and uh, typical unit tests coding tests all these tests will also happen before uh, you test it but uh, this is another way where we you know we just do it with a small set of consumers 
um then of course the deployment right and then you will choose uh, based on this smaller testing uh, samples you will know what is working well for what kind of customers what is not working well and then you go into this whole deployment stage now every model will also have a life cycle like how we as consumers have life cycle for any kind of product uh, the models also have life cycle for example if i'm looking at say forecasting in a covid scenario uh, forecasting does not make sense for me beyond like a week because the needs of the people are changing lockdowns are in lockdowns are out so um, in these kind of scenarios we call this as uh, you know like the uh, model debt that gets generated because of the models that you don't change right this is also becoming a huge problem say after you do the or, or after you deploy the model there are a bunch of tools that are available in the market that you can use for uh, monitoring the models to see whether you are seeing any data drift any pattern drift or any concept drift um so what i mean by this is um like i said uh, covid is definitely a black swan event right so nobody would have any historical data about uh, how things would have changed when something like this happens so um, if we don't monitor it's possible that whatever models that you built pre covid you will assume that everything works well and uh, you will see that all of them will go for a toss because you would have built the algorithms based on the historical data which never had any trace of these kind of events happening and um, this this is like something you know that could seriously affect the uh, you know the way you are running the product itself so which is why these the, like the model ops or ml ops that you will probably you know see everywhere in youtube medium is becoming so popular and especially over the last uh, you know 2 to 3 years we are seeing a huge spike in the uh, ml ops tools and uh, you know different uh, cloud providers are also coming up with this now i also wanted to tell you guys uh, like a path right this is uh, so this is again based on my experience so it could vary uh, based on everyone's individual journey but i believe these are some of the things that you guys can start off with now while you're still in college to get yourself familiar and uh, be like a edge over the rest of the uh, you know students right at least when i hire uh, for you know the data science interns or uh, for you know people from the college uh, we will definitely look at who has a uh, edge over the rest of the folks right uh, because it's not that you guys would already have experience working in this domain for us to come ask questions and take right it's all about who had the interest who had the vision to do this and who has put in that effort so in that way um, you know mathematics for machine learning is really important and i think uh, in our college itself uh, in some of the courses they are covering but um, if you want to learn more and uh, you know if you want to just brush up on very specific concepts that are going to be interesting for you on machine learning you can find courses in udemy and coursera i have personally liked uh, the way coursera has designed this course so uh, definitely you know um, this will be a very very useful course for you and the reason why i am asking you to start with this is that uh, it will help you to understand and of which or way as compared to you know starting directly with uh, a complex problem and coding right coding is like the non negotiable skill um, again sql any kind of sql will be very good uh, python is a preferred language in most of the companies but uh, definitely r and sas or also you know things that you can learn and um, like i told about visualization um, we can do you know hundreds of cool projects we can be a great mathematician but if you are not able to visualize and story tell on how your uh, algorithm or how your project is really impacting the consumers you you will never succeed uh, in this uh, domain right so uh, which is why i strongly recommend that uh, you guys pick up either of the i mean any any tool even quick sight is good uh, i mean any 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 visualization tool that you want to pick up and um, algorithms right this is like a vast subject um, so i just specified like the three top things that uh, uh, you know you can just shop on how is it different from unsupervised learning reinforcement learning 
um you can basic ones right like regression uh, like linear regression logistic regression what are the different classification techniques that are there what are the pro- problem statements where we use which algorithm there are hundreds of cheat sheets and hundreds of videos available uh, so you can just go through these to un- understand one is application and what are like the uh, algorithms and what libraries are associated with it right? whichever tool you are going to or whichever language you are going to prefer here accordingly you can um, do like a one to one mapping and uh, learn this and this is also very very important right now if you see uh, i have like more than 20 customers for whom we are delivering data science for projects and uh, trust me 18 of those customers are uh, cloud technologies right azure or aws or gcp this uh, have to understand the cloud technology and if not it is possible for us to survive so um, while you guys are still you know ramping up in college you can just go through google amazon website azure website there are lot of basic courses uh, basic you know training videos that are available and uh, for students i think lot of uh, these uh, players are also giving free course contents and access so you should just pick one of them so why i am asking you guys to pick one of them in all these blocks is um, don't overdo it because um, in the last 13 years every project that i get into i encounter a new technique a new algorithm a new technology a new cloud so this is just not going to end and you will never feel like you know you have completed everything and at this point when you are starting to get into the space it's better to be thorough with one and then start building uh, your skills on the rest for example among these three google cloud and azure are very easy to pick up as compared to aws so um, you know and and plus once you get one of the cloud technologies the other one is going to be very easy so in your head you can always you know map okay this is uh, s3 in aws this is the you know equivalent in uh, google cloud this is equivalent in azure that it becomes very easy for you to map and uh, you know scale up whenever you guys encounter the other cloud technologies and i think i spoke about coursera and udemy both of them are very good um so for python and uh, for other things you can probably go <coughs> go with udemy um even for, for if you plan to take up any uh, aws uh, ml or azure ml certification uh, you can either go with the microsoft amazon provided courses or you can go for uh, you know udemy courses um yeah as and when you guys are learning all these things um, i think you guys should also try kaggle competitions it is not about winning or being on top of the rank or anything but um, it's all about just getting that flavor of how a project will be executed what kind of challenges you know you are facing you can just form a group right i i don't think everybody in the college is going to get into this field i'm sure there will be like say 10% or whatever percent um, enthusiasts maybe you guys can form a club form like a team of five and you know start attending some of these uh, problems right uh, it will give you a good flavor of uh, you know uh, the different varieties of problem different techniques you can see how your uh, other teams are performing you can uh, go and look at their videos on how they have solved the problem where you you were not able to etc and uh, of course kd nuggets and medium uh, also are very good uh, sources to learn things i have seen them published really really good articles uh, where i have learned a lot of new concepts and of course uh, not just that um, all these things are really important for you to be the best in this field uh, one is great communication right um, it's not about english it's about articulating what exactly um, you know are you are you trying to do or whatever you have done you should be able to communicate and story tell i'm just repeating that because this is where i've seen lot of very good data scientists not shine um, in in a corporate environment and uh, never stop learning right um, this is also another mantra every single week i have a spe- you know specific time that i put in my calendar to learn uh, there is always something new to learn i will always try and pick a problem i will e- even if there is nothing for that weekend i will go talk to my customers figure out you know if they are struggling with something then go and research about it try to solve it 
that is the only way for us to you know keep our uh, brains active and in this process you will also learn quite a lot think outside the box right this is another thing that um, uh, mr sharma also covered in the previous one um not everything is going to be solved with the same uh, thing right uh, typically what i'm seeing now with uh, you know the people uh, is that they just go to github try to copy the code and then you know uh, try to replicate whatever somebody has already done and this is just killing the whole spirit and the fun part of data science right so think of a new uh, way to solve it it's okay to start with the uh, you know things that are available in the git but um y- y- there should be your touch to it there should be your style of solving that problem as well right so it, it just cannot be just copying uh, just knowing where which code exists and just trying to master it right that is not all and that might work out maybe in the first couple of years but eventually you will you will reach a stagnant place and you will not be able to grow so yeah those are the things that i wanted to cover thank you so much again for the opportunity now uh, you guys can ask me any questions any questions uh i couldn't understand the question what is that full stack developer is college study is important that's a very tricky question i i hope the uh, <laughs> i hope my, uh, none of our professors are there <laughs> i i did everything in cg other than studying and scoring i i just got 8 point something and i uh, somehow passed but i had a lot of fun um, built a lot of network uh, i volunteered for you know things like kurukshetra and uh, did a lot of things so i don't i personally don't think uh, your marks really matter it doesn't matter you just have to know uh, what exactly you want to do and uh, be just for you that i didn't want to pursue uh, you know any job in electronics and communication per se but i wanted to do something related to analytics because that is the area that was booming at that point like in 2008 when i was in cg so uh, i was just focused on the subjects that uh, really matter to me uh, and really matter for my career and how i wanted my career to go so um that is just my personal view so okay um but good question prajit thank you why do we feel tough to do ml projects um it is not tough kavi yeah so i don't know what kind of use case you have taken uh, if you feel like uh, you know any any specific challenges are there you can always reach out to me in linkedin and uh, i will i will definitely you know get back to you maybe not the same day but uh, over the weekend i should be able to uh, help you guys release the blockers at least do we get interns to any companies to start a real time project yes there are many companies like even uh, i take interns uh, i just completed uh, the hiring for interns uh, and it's a good way for us to also start right but even for internship uh, if for example 100 people apply for me the criteria will be who will be able to do my work faster with just uh, you know less uh, coaching and everything right so what i i personally look for is is this person very good in coding right python is something that i look for and of course the other things are like uh, basic things like sql you know like basic basics of algorithms so these are some of the things that we look for when we take internship um third year 
so it depends right uh, it's not necessary that um, you have to do masters i did not do masters i directly went into mu sigma um, so i i think some of you know right mu sigma was founded by our own cg alumni and uh, he he came to our college when he first you know started with his whole hiring process and uh, that's how i got into analytics um, so it's not necessary that you should take masters that is fine uh is it necessary for other department students to learn it depends on what you want to do uh, like i said uh, when i was in the college i didn't i only focused on the subjects that i liked and i was interested in uh i just merely wanted to pass the rest of the things the hardest part of the career um it, so i don't know how i don't think you guys can relate to it like when we are in college when we pass our go into a job it's like uh it's all like super fun right because you are with friends um you don't have you know real like when i got married that is when i had a very tough time right i had to take a call whether i want to give up my career or whether you know i want to uh, continue etc so that was very hard for me then uh, when i had my kid uh, i have a, a son so when i have to travel multiple times uh, because of workshops because of you know something related to work i've had some you know really uh, big troubles because emotionally you know i was really stuck but uh, other than that uh, sometimes studying all the time keeping up with uh, the technology that is also very tough right because you're already slogging for 5 days in a week and then saturday sunday sometimes i just feel like chilling but um, it, it's important for me to also keep myself updated because then you know i i will fall behind so you have to keep learning all the time uh, excuse me ma'am yeah uh, guys if you have any other question you can send the question to the given mail id we have shared a mail id in the chat box uh you can ask your questions there your questions will be answered yeah thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for such an enlightening session we will surely take your words thanks for your time It's now time for the promo screening of K Awards. Awards Glorifying the Unpraised is a very distinct annual award show organized during Kurukshetra. A dedicated team searches for the suitable nominees who get insufficient recognition in spite of their valuable achievements. This year, K Awards 2021 is back with a set of six superheroes who are going to be crowned tomorrow. Now let us look take a look on to the AV please meet rishikesh kulkarni he is an electronics engineer at pravag dynamics which is the first indian electric vehicle maker to claim such a huge range in its commercial offering he is a professional with a demonstrated history of working in formula student project he is skilled in the design and development of electric power drain and battery management system let us hear from a renowned and final guest speaker of the day Rishikesh Kulkarni via his exclusive Kate Talk.
ஜிபிள் <laughs> is it is it visible now ah oh, yeah the screen is mm, yeah just now i was saying uh what is it is it visible now visible okay yeah sure uh so yeah hello everyone i i am from prabhik dynamics I'm, my name is rishikesh kulkarni and i work as an electronics engineer so i basically look after the entire uh, battery management system and in vehicle network and how did it start for me i'll give a brief introduction about myself i was part of a formula student team uh, at my college uh, so we might be having uh, societies which are forums where automobile enthusiasts might get a, a chance to put their skills forward so basically to put their skills forward so basically formula students started out in germany it was uh it was built for the very specific thing that in the industry automobile we wherein students can put in the theoretical knowledge they they have uh, gained over their courses their practice which can be put to work and they could make a practical use of that very knowledge and uh, thus uh, something called as formula student germany started the indian leg of it is called as formula bharat and uh, i i am i was a part uh, of that competition and i guess that is where the uh, the keen sense of understanding of automobiles uh, started for me the fascination and the passion was always there because as a kid whoever you might be a boy or a girl they are still fascinated by moving objects they do follow it and cars or uh, automobile in general are very uh, something which we are introduced to as a kid and we are always fascinated by it but uh, it, it during the course of four years i got to understand how exactly automobiles work and developed a keen sense of understanding so I'll, so today what we are going to do is i'll take you through a b- brief period of how exactly uh, the automobile industry work how its intricacies are and what is the one revolution which is currently happening you are already aware about it but i'll present my take my how i look at it i i look at it uh, these things and along with that uh, how what we had, so can, so like in indian automobile industry is is very especially in india i'm relating all of this can be very relatable uh, because we're talking in, uh, in ge- geographic sense of india uh, it's it's i'll say a very well developed industry in a sense where uh, back in the days everyone uh, in in 90s used to aspire to own a car and uh, it was like 
more or less it was going to be a maruti 800 from there on to something which is uh, now coming again from an indian manufacturer which is a tata harrier we have evolved quite a lot is is what you can see so there are multiple manufacturers but uh, you know the way industry works is it is only uh, the logo of the car uh, the logo which you can see on the car it's just the oem the original equipment manufacturers the entire industry works on uh, tiering of suppliers so you you have that your car might have thousands of parts and every part is made from a different entity so, so you might possibly have heard of the tier 1 suppliers which are like continental bosch uh, and nxp so these are the ones you know of but every small part it's not the oem who makes who makes this contribution it's uh, every single small entity which is boiled down to tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 suppliers these are the ones who make the small parts and it's the integrator uh, or the oem uh, who finally puts in all these things together and uh, you can finally uh, see a car on the road so overall the industry has be, a few a very small fact uh, uh, which is fascinating was that electric cars had uh, developed as in in terms of uh, raw technology before uh, combustion engines so late 1800s uh, it's sound but the commercial feasibility of those was not much especially you know, uh, diesel counterparts so uh, that is when the likes of ford then later on uh, the germans took over and uh, forced in the era of combustion engine but uh, later on as again uh, so basically after that the consumption of fuel per se uh, increased so drastically uh, that your entire world economy was based around oil prices so uh, right now i guess the previous speaker uh, was was talking about data and they consider data as a new oil and yeah so uh, again i'll say uh, along with data energy is the new oil energy in terms of electric and uh, electric energy because the way you move the way you uh, the way you move around uh, is going to change in the coming duration so there earlier there were a very few companies like in fact not earlier in just 10 years down the line there were very few companies maybe some 10 odd companies globally some three four odd companies in uh, India who were making or manufacturing vehicles or cars or two wheelers uh, but that scenario has changed with the introduction of electric vehicles uh, the entire uh, way you look at uh, the and uh, an automobile has changed because of electric vehicles new players have come in uh, you there is rimac there is uh, faraday future there is lucid and in fact the older ones who were actually lobbying on to uh, delay the era of uh, electric vehicles like uh, the giants from BMW, Audi, Mercedes Benz, they too have started making electric vehicles. And on top of that, the one single entity who has uh, pushed forward this entire revolution is Tesla. And they have revolutionized, they have made electric car sexier, they have made electric car performance driven, they have, uh, they have taken down the notion that electric cars can't perform to their gasoline counterparts. In fact, they don't not just compete, but they excel uh, in terms of performance. And the cost of ownership of an electric car for its lifetime is much, much, much lesser compared to its gasoline counterpart. So the basic understanding of this very uh, thing comes from the systematic systemic gains which you get from converting from a gasoline to an electric vehicle. Say, so if you take any general combustion engine the maximum efficiency its uh, engine can generate it's, it's or uh, it can source the energy from the fuel it put in is around the range of 20 to 30 percent in fact uh, toyota had kind of gained a very high efficiency of around 40 percent uh, which was considered to be like a marvel back in uh, when they when they uh, when they made it but just by switching from a combustion to an electric powertrain, uh, 
irrespective of optimization you generally get an efficiency of 75% so from the same amount of in input you given you are extracting much more so the systemic gains you gain out of uh, electric vehicle technology are much higher and your entire ecosystem uh, currently right now is built around lithium ion as being the primary source of uh, energy so lithium ion cells being the primary source of energy so there's a downside to it as well so the energy density of diesel is is like say like 20 times that of lithium ion cells so that leads us to the problem of uh, having to have a larger battery pack or which consumes a lot of space which is uh which is heavier and thus it leads to a uh, problem of uh, having battery being the costliest as well as the heaviest part on your vehicle so to, there are many challenges which which the ev era has uh, ushering as it ushers in we are going to bound to face so majorly that is going to be the initial cost as i said battery being a bigger com- battery being a costlier component uh, electric cars are anywhere 1.5 to 2x uh, costlier than uh, its gasoline counterparts and the refueling time uh, in a electric sense it's the recharging time uh, it, it's much much higher uh, even if it's how much ever we uh, squeeze it it's, it's still uh, to the tune of say half an hour one hour two hours compare that to your refueling which is just going to be a two or three minutes or so people are people do get anxious because of uh, how much amount of fuel they have and in electric terms how much soc is left but that uh, that can be solved uh, with the uh, next problem which which we encounter that which is of the charging infrastructure right now especially in india the grid setup uh, for charging is is not that uh, extensive uh, it will surely be there so all of the electric all of the geographies which have adopted electric there has been a major push there from the government in terms of subsidies in terms of uh, charging infrastructure so that that is yet to be there right now you can walk into any garage and get your car service or your bike serviced but uh, that won't be the case with electric vehicles you need specialized people who know about the stuff uh, who are licensed who are authorized to do uh, servicing and maintenance and the skewed nature of the industry itself because the investments made by the OEM giants into electric uh, into combustion technology they were hesitant to move to electric but now as we see a huge amount of push from the people uh, who have uh from the uh, from the governments from uh, activists and from the general public as well the industry has bowed down to that pressure and now we are moving to the electric vehicle era so what we are doing at praveg is we are giving you the best way to move in a city and if you look at it the amount of time uh, people spend on the road uh, has increased almost 4x people back in 20 years back were spending like half an hour to go from their office uh, from their home to office and back or probably even from your colleges uh, to and fro to the college the amount of time you have spent the amount of distance you were covering is increasing the diameters of our cities are increasing and amount, and the resultant of this that the pollution which is caused by these vehicles uh, who are transporting you they have also increased and there's a very grim situation especially in our capital of uh, delhi the air quality index is very very poor so what we offer with praveg is we g- give you the freedom to take back control of all the resources which you have lost so what we give to is you are spending say like 90 or 120 minutes on the road every day you can actually you utilize those minutes uh, so our cars will be equipped with say like a tree table which where you can uh, use it as a workspace it will have recliner seats where you can uh get yes i'll get just relax or uh it will have we are partnered up with the vrl music systems who will who basically produce the best sound in the world so you can get yourself entertained so it's a office on wheels it's a bedroom on wheels it's a concert on wheels so you are basically getting the amount you spend every day on the road uh back and you can have it rather than 
we are also will be offering a very uh, enriched himalayan air uh, with the air quality index at least 10 times the uh, levels of uh, the co2 levels uh, which are on on general public roads so basically what uh, we offer to lindos the individuals we are going to lease it out you have to pay a monthly subscription fee and you can use the car for unlimited kilometers uh, anywhere in the city so uh, praveg how like the road map which we can see is we found it back in 2011 uh, by two of our co-founders mr uh, dabal kullar and uh, mr dad bagri uh, i guess you guys have might have seen a videos doing rounds on the internet or on maybe magazines or youtube uh, after the emergency event in delhi in uh, december the uh, last year so basically that that that's where we uh, before that we were under in a stealth mode uh, per se and from there on we have now emerged and uh, are are putting our foot forward uh, to being competitive in the automotive industry and then uh, we plan to uh, start commercial production of extension mark 2 which is our latest uh, uh, production spec vehicle uh, beginning in november 2021 so the the vehicle which i am talking about is uh, will have uh, the specific uh, specification which you can see on the screen but to add to that the most important thing is with the way our business model is functioning you don't have to worry about the specifications of the vehicle you don't have to worry about where are you going to charge your vehicle uh, where are you going to maintain it where are you going to park it the utilization factor of your car will go really high currently your car is just once you bite uh, it turn on if you bite its value falls down by 30% even before leaving the showroom and add on to that that 5% uh, its entire lifetime rest of it is sitting in a parking lot in your office or maybe in your college or in your uh, or, or in your uh, home so that utilization factor can be increased uh, with the business model we propose so currently right now we are like a team of some 72 odd people we are based out of band the picture you can see on screen is is of our battery factory which is uh, uh, currently under construction so we you can join and find out what all rules we have to offer at uh, praveg.com/careers and follow us on social media so i guess this is this is how uh, we at at praveg uh, see the world uh, and this is how my perspective about how the automobile industry is evolving uh, in in the in the coming future and uh, i'm i'm very honored to firstly represent praveg and at k talks uh, thank you so much for your uh, invitation thank you. and uh, you have a really wonderful team they coordinated really well with us and uh, thank you thank you so much so if if you have any questions uh, i'll be happy to answer them Hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. So the first question which I can see is, how do you how do you started to get an idea of making a startup? So uh, I like to clarify one thing. I'm not the founder, although I I. i can tell you how exactly a startup work is you firstly should have something an idea which which uh, can cause a massive dip, disruption in the way people are uh, looking in in people's lives basically uh, if if it is not uh, disruptive per se or if it is uh, 
it it is as good as a business start be innovative uh startup in most of the cases uh, there are some bootstrap uh, startups ventures as well but in most of the cases it's funded by an external agency uh, by an, by a uh, by a vc or by a, uh, an angel investor but uh, the whole idea around building a startup is about uh, what what idea do you have and how do you execute it uh, and you can find those ideas in in your daily life uh, about the difficulties which people face and uh, to put in perspective uh, kunal shah who is is the founder of uh, cred and previously free charge he put in a very nice pointer that if you're taking people from an inefficient state to a more efficient state and they have compelling reasons to not leave you even when a better product is offered that is a really good startup idea so think about it in that perspective that uh, am i helping people solve their problems and if 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 the answer is yes and people are willing to stick on to your idea uh, it, it's a good a good startup idea uh, yeah uh between lithium and batteries of fuel cells which is going to be more sustainable source of power for evs in the future yeah so if you look at it uh fuel cells in a commercial perspective are not yet viable uh although uh, the developments which are happening at a very rapid pace in in that uh, industry as well so sustainability uh fuel cells are much sustainable but if you see commercially they will be much much more expensive to implement uh in in place of uh, lithium ion cells so as of now we can see lithium ion being a uh, short to medium term alternative to combustion uh, vehicles but uh, if in, you look out at a longer perspective yes there are many technologies there's lithium uh, there's fuel cell uh, there are sodium ion cells so there are multiple technologies which which are coming up next is uh the design of praveg is awesome thank you thank you so much how does those idea and design come up so it's we have a design team they it is i'm to be honest i'm not the right person to answer this but yeah we we love obviously uh, whenever they design we criticize them uh, to the fullest extent and, and that's why how, how i guess uh, <laughs> the best design comes out but seriously i'm not the right person to answer this question uh, maybe you can connect with designers uh, if possible uh, is there any research going based on alternatives other than the material battery of course yes research never stops uh, but in prave you know right now we are majorly focusing on something which is uh, so basically if you look at it engineering is something which uh, when you take pure sciences and make it commercially viable uh, for for the masses that is what engineering is all about so right now we're doing it that only so in that sense itself that we are taking lithium ion battery which is a kind of a pure science uh, uh, and then applying it for electric vehicles and taking it to the masses so right now uh, there are a lot of research going on all around the globe but not at praveg specifically thank you for, for your sharing your point on some yes uh, you're welcome what are the safety measures you assure for a customer that a passenger would get electrocuted in case of crash or anything uh, any other circumstances which causes the kitchen electricity so, yeah nice question so basically what we do is uh, our battery packs uh, there are multiple ways we try to avoid this one is the battery pack is completely isolated from uh, the cabin so there's a huge block of i won't reveal the material but there's a huge block of metal in sitting in between you and uh, uh, and and uh, between the battery and bin where you are sitting the driver and the passenger are sitting and the battery is used uh, is basically it has a inner lining of an insulated material uh, there are many uh, maybe you, you might have heard of something called as nomex which is in with a uh, b- very high dielectric strength uh, so these are the materials which are used uh, for insulating and then of course you have insulation which is a part of battery management system so it acts as a resistance between your 
chassis and your battery voltage so these two completely are different isolated systems so if it finds that the resistance has fall, fallen below, below a certain threshold it will uh, disc look it will disconnect the battery from the entire system so there are multiple uh, measures in place to ensure that uh, the occupants don't get electrocuted so tell about solar electric vehicle solar electric vehicle yeah uh, it's it's of course uh, i i i find there's uh, some competition which happens uh, but right now if you look at it the amount of energy which is which can be extracted out of a solar cell uh, is very less compared to the amount of energy uh, or the amount of power required by an electric vehicle to move so uh, as of now if, as the technology progresses we can extract much more uh, power out of us out of the same area of an electric cell so as we go along it can surely be uh, something which we will become so viable in terms of or else you'll have a solar electric vehicle which runs on say like 10 kilometers per hour speed which no one wants so yeah as as technology evolves we'll surely have uh, electric vehicles with solar input as well hello sir what is your view on hybrid hybrid technology so hybrid technology was something which so was touted to be as a bridge between combustion and uh, electric but uh, you know it all depended on factors about how uh, the ecosystem and the government the industry in terms of the manufacturers look at it and uh, it was say like 10 years back it was supposedly said that uh, hybrid will be taken on and will be the next step after combustion we don't want to get to electric uh, directly but i feel it's it's something like uh, taking a too longer a route uh, if you are eventually going to change change it directly so my personal view is uh, jumping from combustion to electric is going to be a bit difficult for most of us but it uh, for me it, it's it's the best bet because it's uh you know if if the infrastructure is in place uh, electrics will be much much more uh, uh, like beneficial in terms of its efficiency in general and also i feel hybrid uh, is is adding an unnecessary step in the eventual uh, transformation and yeah hello sir do pev and bhev have a crucial role in future uh yeah plug in high plug in evs and yeah of course they do uh, i guess my entire presentation was around a focus that uh, electric vehicles uh, are going to be the next next big thing and uh, there are many opportunities coming up so all of you who are uh, young college grad, undergrads uh, if you could focus on stuff which are going into the automobile industry so automobile industry requires people from almost every field Uh, you will require people from, from mechanical and your structures your chassis vehicle dynamics we require electronics engineers more there are so many there are multiple issues which are part of your vehicle system uh, which are which requires electronics engineering there are multi, a lot of coding has to be done you require software you require coding skills so there is a lot of potential in automobile industry to uh, create new opportunities and uh, that is something uh, which i feel that yeah uh, it it's a very nice platform for, for you guys if you are interested in this uh, something and of course going ahead we also uh, have uh, something w- which you guys might relate to uh, compare comparing to uh, the previous speakers as well uh, autonomous driving a lot of data science uh, pardon me if, my, if i'm wrong if i'm wrongly using terms uh, but uh, a lot of data science and machine learning will go into uh the making of of autonomous vehicle and uh, yeah is is conforming to industry standards and hindrances to disrupt the technology in startups yes of course industry standards uh, are stringent in a way uh, but they are necessary you cannot uh, bias them and yeah the i it is a hindrance in a sense uh that uh, many of your disruptive ideas per se fit to something and uh, if it is something which is safety critical then uh, i feel that uh, standards have to be adhered to but if you can f- justify that uh, by implementing whatever disruptive technology you have uh if you can bypass those standards in a very uh in a very uh non 
in a way which is not affecting safety, then yeah, you can surely uh, bypass those. Hardware startups are known to have a larger hurdles in getting from idea to market. Sure, I completely agree. Does the long timeline justify the effort? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, I, I want to appreciate the challenges faced. Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, it's for hardware startup, the basic problem I am, uh, for an example, if you get a code piece of code wrong, and so basically what you do is maybe skim through it and debug it. And once you find the error, you can basically re-upload, compile the code. But uh, in a hardware, if you possibly doing a, end up doing a mistake in say your PCB design or something, or a electric uh, schematic capture or something, you basically have to find the right parts it will take you some 15, 20 days. Basically, getting everything in your hand is much, much more difficult uh, because considering the time constraints you have, so it's it's very difficult uh, for a, for a hardware-based startup. Uh, but uh, if you look at it, these we are making something which is going to create a huge impact. So uh, we are doing stuff for making Peter. So yes, it is. It is the effort is totally justified. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for giving us an opportunity to pick your brain. So with that, we have come to the end of today's meet. Uh, the end always seeks a new beginning. Greetings again. It's now time to pull off the curtains. But before that, I would like to thank our guest speakers. Tatavit Barba, Head of Strategy and Operations at Walmart Labs. Mutumari S, Head of Data Science Brillio and Rishikesh Kulkarni, engineer from Pravik Dynamics. Thank you so much for your wonderful words that lightened up our brains today. I extend my gratitude to the Dean, Dr. S. Inian, Chief Coordinator, CTF, Dr. Swaminathan, for their guidance and support to organize the event. A special shout out to all our sponsors, namely the Autodesk, the Hyperstack, Govi Geek Network, Cronus Software, Abdul, University of Twent, and Mera Events, who have also played a major role in establishing Kurukshetra this year and supporting us throughout. A big thanks to them. Finally, I wholeheartedly thank all the staff and student audience, without whom the whole show could not have been lit. Thank you all. Uh, guys, you may leave this.